This is the second podcast in a series of three which looks at language development in the brain. In this podcast, I will look at the early work of Broca and Wernick and consider the role of the left temporal region of the brain. I will also look at some of the ways in which young babies begin to process the sounds of speech. In the first podcast, we looked at some of the classical theories from the 20th century, which sought to explain the incredibly rapid pace at which young children develop language. We looked at the empirical ideas of Skinner and Bandura. Skinner suggested that it was all to do with positive reinforcement, while Bandura's ideas were based around imitation. In contrast, we considered the ideas of Chomsky and Skinner, who both developed the nativist position. Early brain studies by Paul Broker and Carl Wernick identified an area in the left part of the brain that, if damaged, had a drastic effect on speech production. This area is in the left temporal lobe, roughly behind the left ear. Paul Broca carried out her post-mortem on a patient who for many years had only been able to say one nonsense word. Whenever he tried to speak, he could only say tan, 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 tan. When Broca examined the man's brain, he found that the part of the brain known as the left inferior frontal gyrus was damaged. He concluded that one area which is important in the production of speech is the left inferior frontal lobe. This part of the brain is now known as Broca's area. Karl Wernick, also in the 19th century, worked with patients who had experienced strokes and who had difficulties in understanding spoken language. Their vocabulary was wider than Broca's patient, but they tended to speak nonsensical words and sentences. Wernick discovered that this was caused by damage to the posterior region of the superior temporal gyrus, and suggested that this part of the brain affected our ability to understand and remember language. This part of the brain is known as Wernick's area. We now know that most of us process language in this left temporal region of the brain. Even in newborn babies, we can see that the left hemisphere of the brain is more active in listening to speech than the right. There are a number of studies that look at what happens to the speech of children who damage the left side of their brain. And we give some details of this research in our book, Child Development and the Brain. Suffice to say here that there is some evidence to suggest that the left temporal region of the brain has a slightly different structure to other parts of the cortex, and that this allows for the incredibly rapid processing needed when speaking and listening. What is also becoming clear is that there are lots of different regions of the brain that are activated during both speaking and listening. Even newly born babies are using quite a number of different areas to process language, and these areas are spread way beyond the area of the temporal cortex. Another finding from neuroscience is that a huge amount of language occurs at a very early age. Although children do not start to say recognisable words until somewhere between 10 and 15 months, we have known for some time that they are able to recognise words much earlier than this. Since the 1970s, neuroscience has been telling us that even very young babies are able to process 
the sounds of speech and make complex decisions about the structure of the language they are hearing. Annette Karmeloff Smith refers to the unborn child as the busy eavesdropper in the womb, which I think captures rather graphically the huge amount of listening and processing of language that takes place before birth. What babies are doing at this very early stage is listening to the language sounds around them and making decisions about what category of sound they are hearing. The sounds they are processing are called phonemes. These are the smallest units of language. Ushio Goswami calls them the smallest grains of language. All the world's languages use two distinct types of phonemes, consonant phonemes and vowel phonemes. Across the globe, there are about 600 different consonant phonemic sounds and about 200 vowel sounds. Individual languages, however, tend to use just a small number of these. English, for example, uses about 44 phonemes. Let's take a simple example. The word dog has three phonemes, d, o, g. The word bath also has three, b, a, th. At birth, the human brain is capable of distinguishing all of these different sounds, as well as all of those from all the languages of the world. Peter Imas and his colleagues found that even babies that were just one month old were able to make the distinction between different phonemes that they heard. Babies from one month onward could, for example, distinguish between a b sound and a p sound. Have a go at making these sounds for yourself. What's the difference? One way of understanding the difference between the two sounds is to experience the amount of breath we use to produce each of them. If you put your hand in front of your mouth and make alternative b and p sounds, you will notice that one produces quite a lot of puff and the other one doesn't. The p phoneme is known as a voiced consonant, as to produce it involves the vibration of the vocal cords. The b phoneme is known as a voiceless consonant, as to produce the sound we do not need to vibrate our vocal cords. Emas and his colleagues' research used a speech synthesizer to produce a range of sounds along a continuum between a voiced and a voiceless consonant. In one experiment, the sound shifted from the p to the b sound. For us adults, there is a measurable point at which sounds that are so highly similar to each other stop being perceived as a b and start being perceived as a p. The brain makes a decision as to whether what it is hearing is a p sound or a b sound. Emus and colleagues found that babies between one and four months old were able to make the same distinction. This process is called categorical speech perception. The ability to hear the difference is really important, as dividing sounds up into categories in this way is a significant first step in being able to distinguish the sounds of speech, and so understand language. In this podcast, we have looked at the early work of Broca and Warnick. We have also looked at the way that babies begin to process the sounds of language, and the way that they're able to make distinguishings 
be able to distinguish between the different sounds. And this ability, we have said, is called categorical speech perception. There is more information about this topic and others in our book, Child Development and the Brain.